So hello everybody and uh, welcome to another UFI Connect session. Uh, today, uh, coming from UFI's Bonn Home Office, uh, which is me, uh, with the support of the back end in Paris and speakers in the UK and the US. It's the wonder and the marvel of technology. Uh, I am Kai Hattendorf, the CEO of UFI. For those of you who don't know me, and I will be your moderator today. And a very special welcome to Simon Foster and Cliff Wallace, our speakers today. I will hand over to you in just a minute. Um, but briefly, let me take a moment to introduce UFI Connects uh, to you. As we launched this uh, series of online events just last week, for a very simple reason. Now, as the COVID-19 pandemic keeps exhibition industry professionals apart, our need to talk, to discuss, to stay connected to each other and to learn is probably bigger than ever. And if we connect this a program of educational talks, panels, and sessions, we will use this to provide content and dialogue while our regular events and educational programs cannot take place as usual. You will have seen the announcements that our usual wave of spring conferences forever, uh, for instance, had to be postponed or canceled. Now, including all of us today, we have already had more than a thousand industry professionals joining the series session, the previous sessions live, and uh, about the same number of people have been watching them afterwards on demand. And uh, you can see upcoming programming as well as previous sessions on demand at www.ufi.org slash uficonnects. That said, some brief housekeeping notes. Uh, we have put you all on mute while our speakers are talking, and we have scheduled time for a discussion afterwards, so I encourage you to ask questions. Now, how do you ask questions when you're on mute? Uh, Zoom, for those of you not yet familiar with it, has a chat function. So you have a line of commands at the bottom of your screen, and one of them is the chat. Please use the chat function to ask your questions. Our back office will pick them up, and I will call you up when we get there. Karen, our colleague uh, Jana is in Paris and monitoring the chat and will reach out to you. Uh, and the team will then activate your microphone and you will be seen on screen if you have your camera on when you ask your question. Just like you would be seen in a, in a conference hall at any normal UFI event. But enough of the housekeeping. Uh, today's session is all about leadership and about how you can navigate your business through a crisis like the current one. And we are honored to have with us today, Cliff Wallace, a true legend of our industry. And if I may say so, not just a former UFI president, but also a great mentor and teacher for many of us. And Simon Foster, one of the most experienced leaders we have in the industry on the organizer side. So we, we have two heavyweights, not by weight, but by merit. Uh, on the line today, and both of them don't really need much more of an introduction, and they're ready to go. So again, welcome to Cliff, welcome to Simon, and over to you, Simon, please take it away. Thanks, Kai. Thanks for brilliantly navigating the tricky introductions as you did there. That's fantastic. Um, from my perspective, I just want to move very quickly through the admin. Thank you very much to Ufi for the opportunity to do this. It feels great to be able to hopefully help and input as we go through this crisis. And thank you also to everybody in UFI for all they've been doing so far in keeping us connected and keeping us informed and trying to keep us informed of what's going on in the industry in these an unprecedented times, which I think is the most used phrase that I've heard at the moment uh, in terms of where we are. Um, we spent a few days talking about this and it's, it's a real pleasure for me, as, as Kai just said, to, to be able to um, both see Cliff again, because it feels like a long time since I've seen him before, but also have the chance to talk to him and, and myself also tap into his experience his vast experience as we go through this and hopefully I can interject and, and add a few things as we go along. Um, but the format is very much of a discussion between myself and Cliff and then as Kai said coming to questions afterwards or through the, um, or through the, uh, the chat group here. Um, we are also taking a couple of polls as we go through which hopefully you have seen or can see and we'll, we'll try and draw reference to them as we go along. So as we talked about today, we really wanted to split it into two parts. So Cliff and I are going to try and have a chat for around 20, 25 minutes and then leave the rest of the session open for questions, as we've said. And real, the focus is really to take a slightly different look to what many of the other seminars have been doing or the webinars have been doing about where we are at the moment. The premise being that we've been through crises before as an industry. 
this one is probably not like any other in the extent and, the, and, and, and where we're going at the moment. And the most troubling thing, of course, is the uncertainty about when it's going to end and where it's going to go. But there is one certainty, which is it will end and we will come out the other side and there will be light at the end of the tunnel. Our only big challenge at the moment is understanding where the, how long the tunnel is and where that light will appear. So one of the things uh, we've talked about is really the need, not only as we go through this crisis, to lead for survival, for the survival of our industry, for the survival of our business, I suppose if you're being even more dramatic, for the survival of our species against this pandemic, but it's also to be ready to lead for the future. So leading both through the crisis and survival and then moving to the future. And really that's what we wanted to talk about and really look at. So as we're leading through this, making sure that we can learn from the past, from the things that we've seen before, to learn how we can go through and survive, but not only survive, but be ready and available to flourish when that light at the end of the tunnel comes around. So that's really what we've talked about and hopefully that will work well. Um, and really the first thing that we wanted to pick on and talk through, which Cliff and I talked about, was obviously the closest thing many of us had to this has been the SARS epidemic back in uh, 2003. And really Cliff was at the centre of that in the Hong Kong and Hong Kong Exhibition Centre and what have you. And it did, I think some of his recollections and some of his thoughts, particularly about how we moved through that, is probably as good a place to start in terms of, of where we are. So Cliff, you know, how do you think this feels and compares to SARS and, and, and what comparisons do you think we can draw and, and, and how does it feel in relation to that? Uh, thanks, Simon, and uh, hello to everybody. Um, and thanks, Kai, for this opportunity. I'm, I'm happy to be here and happy to participate and hopefully add something that will be helpful to everybody online. Um, most of you will remember that SARS was uh, the outbreak of SARS came upon us in 2003. Um, although it started in, in China, technically, um, Hong Kong seemed to have gotten most of the, the original attention. And some of the things that we did there, the reason I wanted to spend a few minutes on that today, some of the things that we did there during that time are very, very applicable today and are already proving, certainly for us in our venues in China, including Hong Kong are, are working out this time too. Uh, it was, it was a, effectively a, a dress rehearsal, little did we know, a dress rehearsal. And as it turned out, we, we thought it was the end of the world at the time, but as it turned out, it's a very minute crisis compared to what we're experiencing today. Um, we're up to um, a, a million cases in the world now. Uh, we only had a little over 8,000 cases of SARS and only 813 deaths. Again, it seemed to be very serious and was serious at the time. But now with a million cases and 50,000 deaths globally, we now know that it's being overshadowed by COVID-19. But what I remember precisely is some of the things that we did that were fundamental emergency preparedness procedures in 2003 that should be um, utilized today. Um, our team in Hong Kong immediately gathered as a senior management team, fortunately a very professional and trained team for the, for the 20 years that had been most of the employees, many of the employees had been in place there. We went to our emergency preparedness plan and we had a very, very comprehensive plan, thank goodness. But missing in that plan was any real specificity with regard to disease, um, epidemics, and, and pandemics. So the, the first lesson was that emergency planning and emergency uh, planning manuals and, and plans that venues absolutely should have should now include that particular um, uh, component. Now, it was new, totally unknown. We had to go through a thinking process. And the first thing we had to do is establish some objectives based on the fact that it was so unknown, but that people were dying literally miles, literally kilometers away from the venue. So we immediately went into a 
a, an intensive planning mode and we developed our objectives. The first objective being to, to heighten awareness of the staff, protect the staff and their families, to, to maximize the performance of that staff um, that, were, that we needed to work at the time because the building not only was not closed at the beginning of SARS, it was never formally closed in Hong Kong. And to my knowledge, they never closed any, any venues in mainland China. And if you remember the, the primary cases or, or, or instances of, and cases of SARS and deaths were really isolated to Hong Kong, mainland China, Singapore, and Canada. Um, as it turned out, for instance, in, in the US, there were only some 75 cases. So it, it was literally not taken that serious around the world but we're finding out today, of course, differently with COVID-19. But we had, we, our priority was to take care of the staff and the families, to maximize performance as we could, to maximize the communication and the impact that it was having on the customers of the venue, because they were suffering as much, and the community was suffering throughout the small, medium enterprise uh, throughout the city. Um, we had to become quickly and very aware of the risk based on anticipation, based on the knowledge that our staff immediately obtain from listening to health authorities, World Health Organization, CDCs, local health authorities, any information we could get. And that was one of the primary assignments of the staff and should be today. Our staff ought to be gathering every bit of information it can from any and all sources to develop what is applicable to the venue. Now, with, with that process, we developed the best plan we can. That plan had to be based on anticipation and what then was the limited knowledge. That knowledge grew daily, our plan changed daily. We had to be prepared for change. We had to be flexible. Again, it was new, it was unknown. But I will have to say, and I don't, I don't want this to sound the least bit arrogant, but we had to really concentrate on the fundamentals of leadership and the fundamentals of emergency preparedness. You, you, can, you can make things too difficult. So we tried to focus and did focus on the fundamentals of emergency preparedness that as it turned out in our emergency plan, and I hope everybody else's, the fundamentals really are, are, are working well even today during COVID-19. To the customer, our primary emphasis was to be fair and reasonable. Most of the time we were having to say, can you wait another few days, another few weeks until we know more? Together we will come up with a fair and reasonable um, um, solution to, to minimize the impact on our customers. Now, that was very, very important to us, and it worked out well. I won't go into that detail. We'll go into more of that detail later on. But another thing is we didn't try to do this alone. The staff in Hong Kong, as professional as they were, went to any resource, professional resource they could find, especially local health authorities, medical authorities, and that became a group that together was deciding how we could safely keep the building operating, minimize operating um, problems, and minimize problems for the customers being primarily our, our exhibition organizers. So the venue planning and the anticipating during that time was very, very key, and it's gonna be very, very key for the next months or next weeks throughout the world. And Cliff, that, I mean, obviously it went very successfully in 2003. I remember it well. Um, and I think what you said there is very true about being clear and honest with people as, as you go through in terms of your teams, but also stepping up and taking leadership. But I think there's an important point you said there as well about being flexible. It's one of those things that to me is very evident in this, in this scenario, it was also there in SARS is we don't know all the answers and people can't expect everybody to know all the answers, which I know is often one of the fundamental things of leadership and therefore within the plans and within everything, Sometimes saying we don't know, can we wait or can we do something over the next few days is, is a good thing. I think it's also something that's important in sharing people that you've got plan B's as well. 
I know as event organizers, we don't like to do that. We like to stick with the date, the time, the, the opening and what have you. But actually, this is a time when we can easily say to people, you know, we're, this is where we intend to go and we're going to do our best efforts, but actually be prepared that we could go further on and what have you. Just one thing before we move on to talking about the plans, though. Um, is the one thing you think that you, that, you, that you maybe, aside from not having uh, viruses in the plan, was there anything you think, with hindsight, you wish you'd done better or that, that, that you didn't do at the time that, that would, have, would have made for, 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 for a better reaction? I mean, when we critiqued, and we critiqued every day, but when we critiqued after the thing finally ran down, and, and Hong Kong, the primary period of impact was April to, to June. But um, you can always improve on communication. You can always improve on the way you communicate, not only with your customers, your staff and their families, the, the government, um, the, the media. And the media, the media came to our aid. And the way, you know, you, if we think we can control the media, forget it. If we think we can manage the media, forget it. But I'll tell you what we learned is that you can influence the media. And you can influence the media by being right up front, quickly respond, even to the extent of saying, I don't know the answer, but I'll get back to you with the answer within 24 hours. And we, 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 we ended up using that as a help to us because they in turn were notifying the public and that telling the public what we were doing. Due to our transparency, we were, we were pretty much giving them 98% of what was going on and encouraging uh, the media to, to get that information out and they did it. But even though we did that well, and even though our, we felt like our communications with, with government and the stakeholders was well, you can, you can always improve upon that. And if, and if you're going to add people to your team that are, that are doing things that will help you, not so much in the venue itself or not much, so much in an organizer's uh, staff well it is get people who get the information for you need to surround yourself surround yourself with talent and people that can get resources and information that you can use to make your decisions quicker make the decisions better and to let people know that you've been ultra um, proactive in the process yeah you and i talked about this the other day and and and, and as I say, I do want to go on to talking about the plans themselves, but communication, I think, was a really important thing on all levels. One of the things um, we always used to say when we were in the middle of it is, you can never communicate enough. I know some people will say that's not true, you, you, you need to communicate uh, in normal circumstances, you need to communicate only when you've got something to say. But actually, I remember back when we had the ash cloud and um, that sounds minuscule compared to this as a crisis, but for someone who was stuck in New York at the time, and I had lots of people saying to me, it'll be fine, don't worry, you're in New York, where else you could be in a lot worse place. But actually it wasn't good because even though we were there for 10 days, we didn't know how long we were gonna be there. We didn't know whether it was gonna be two days or a hundred days, which meant every day was disrupted by uncertainty and trying to find information out. Mm. If information is proactive, it always helps. So one of the things that we always find in crises is, even if you've got nothing to say, i.e. there's nothing changed or there's nothing going on, I think communication is really important. And exactly as you said, Cliff, the media are hugely important because honesty and openness is much better than saying nothing. People get suspicious of nothing. But that same thing can also flow through to teams, uh, to, to, to the management teams, to the leadership teams. And going back to what I said before, sometimes it's okay to say, we don't know what the solution is yet, but we're working on it. I, I, for one, have been through many on many of our organizers and venues websites recently, and some of them are excellent. Some of them you go on and you wouldn't even know COVID-19 was on at the moment because shows are still being published in dates and what have you. And I think simple things like that we need to sort of look at and make sure we are communicating as much as possible because that helps with everything. But Cliff, one of the other things I know I found out about you the other day is that you also teach in terms of... Um, um, emergency prepared preparedness i knew i was going to struggle with that word emergency preparedness and you know business continuity planning and what have you so you know from your perspective um 
you know, what are the key aspects of the plan? Because you and I the other day talked about, you know, obvious and simple things. What do you think the key things are to people for having a plan? Although I suppose the obvious first point is, do you have a plan? Well, that is the obvious first point. And I, and I, hope, I hope we'll find out through our little survey process today how many people that are online had an emergency um, preparedness plan before December of 2019 this year. Um, we found out in teaching in China at the UFI VMA uh, Venue Management School in December that only about half of the participants were representing a venue that had emergency um, preparedness plans. I, I don't know what that would be globally, but and we weren't all. We are not only talking about here exhibition centers and large meeting convention centers. We're really talking about public assembly facilities performing arts centers, arenas, stadiums. We, sh we should all be an industry that is centered on priorities. And one of the priorities for, for running a business, an organizing business or venue is to have an emergency preparedness plan that now includes, as I said earlier, epidemics, disease, pandemics. That plan should be thorough. It should be, um, a very precise, comprehensive. It should be practiced. Uh, it should be read regularly, and it it must be an inclusive. We we during during our uh, exercise with SARS, <clears throat> we actually I think we probably amended, updated, and enhanced that plan twenty twenty five times. We, with our plan in Hong Kong, our plan in Shenyang, our plan in Zhengzhou, at those venues, we are regularly enhancing and updating that plan. But the importance is that the staff has to read that plan regularly, practice that plan regularly, and be able to implement it and exercise it instinctively. And that, I, you know, I've got pages and pages of specifics that we're not going to have time to cover today, but somehow we can get those to UFI so they can put them on the website. But <clears throat> the, import, the, the important elements, the most important elements are anticipating and planning what you're going to do and be prepared to do and can do instinctively to re, not only re, not react, but to act once you have that emergency in front of you. Yeah, and I think that was the key thing you said the other day, Cliff, which really resonated to me was the things that are in this are not necessarily complicated. They're just key instinctive mm -hmm. things that you have to do. But the most important thing is to know how to do them and run through them. And, and the reason we, we talked about this was because, as I said earlier, it's not just about surviving now. It's also making sure you survive in a place where you can come out and move through the business. I know in my time of working with businesses in, in, in certainly in UVM, we used to do a lot of what was called business continuity planning and risk, risk registers. And I know, as I'm sure you're all reflecting now, I've sat through many um, board meetings where people have been trudging through and bored with the fact that they have to put this together and can't even contemplate a situation where no one would be able to get to the show or that everything would be down or that things won't happen. And yet time and time we, again, we see them. So, I think it's one of those things that, um, and I don't know whether we can see the poll, Kai or, or um, Pascal, but, you know, thinking yes, about can. whether you... Yes, we can. Let me bring up the poll. Um, um, we have a number of polling questions ready for you, and this is about the emergency preparedness. So um, you, I see the people are already answering. I've put the polling question on the screen. I will leave it there for a few more seconds. So how many of you had emergency preparedness plans for your respective organizations before December 2019, saying before COVID-19. We've got around 100 answers coming in. I'll give you 10 more seconds to answer. Going once, going twice. I will close the poll and I will share the results. there you have it on your screen when you click it away it's gone and you're back to the normal screen so simon cliff uh, 40 percent had something in place 60 percent had nothing in place back to you 
Nice. Well, I wish now we had another question of the 59%, how many wish they did have one in place, but we won't, I guess that's a pretty obvious answer. So I, I, I think that's impressive. I think the fact that we have 41% is good because Cliff shared with me a fact that he was surprised how many, how few, I should say, US venues had, had done this. But I think it's a real, it's a real lesson because one of the things I, we had an emergency once where someone cut through the telephone lines um, going into the industrial estate where our office was and that needed a real business continuity. So it suddenly doesn't have to be a global disaster and our plan really cut in then as to how we would work from home, how we'd use mobile phones, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a key thing, it's a key thing to be, be there about. Um, Simon, Simon, could I just interject one thing there? Um, I, I would have to say that in my experience, in 45 years as a CEO in the venue business, um, in dealing with the press a lot, because I use the press a lot. The, the two questions you can expect in the case of an emergency, and we've already experienced it during COVID-19 here in the US, um, the two questions are one, do you have an emergency preparedness plan? That's what the media is gonna ask. And secondly, if you've got it, are you implementing it? And what are you implementing in it? And the people that are gonna be interested in that are not only the stakeholders, and not only your, your staff families, and not only the, the government, the lawyers for the people that are getting sick and dying are gonna ask that question. And they're gonna, they're gonna use that when they start dealing with responsibility and liability. Yes, so very for. Um, so Cliff, what I'd like to do now is just move just towards a couple of things in terms of coming out and one, uh, coming out of the crisis and how and being prepared and planning for stuff. You and I talked a lot in communication about openness and honesty and what have you. And maybe we can just touch on the partnership and between suppliers, between venues, between contractors and, and organizers and how, how that can be both tension, but also can be positive as you can show from, from the story working in 2003 as to how that can work and, 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 and the importance of, of maintaining those partnerships and how you communicate and work with each other. Well, well first of all, uh, I, Maybe I'm overstating this and, and being too simplistic, as I usually am. Um, there's no reason to hide anything when you're dealing with an emergency like COVID-19 because we've all got the same goal. And the goal is to protect our staff, as I said earlier, our building, our stakeholders, including certainly the customers. Um, and to do that, we've got to do the right thing. And why not be transparent and share the right thing that we're doing with everybody, with the community, with the world for that matter. So if, we, if our objectives are right, um, then we all should be on the same page and we should be able to be open, honest, transparent to the 99th degree, if not 100%. Um, I would say the worst thing in the world that we've experienced, particularly here in the US, is worst thing in the world during this crisis has been a national election. That's impacted how people, what people are doing, saying, and what the objectives are. Uh, the objectives, I mean, things are confusing. And, and the, the, the leadership in these cases has to be upfront, transparent, step forward, know what they're talking about, and be clear. If there's confusion, if they're voids, what's gonna happen? The, spe the, the media is going to speculate and the worst thing in the world towards solving a, a crisis is when you're battling speculation and that speculation is drama, not the fundamentals of correcting the crisis. And you, you talked a lot the other day about the positive relationship between UBM um, and the venue um, back in back in 2003 and how that openness and, and the, uh, the honesty had really balanced and allowed you to smooth through the situation, something which I saw from a distance in, in terms of what was going on. And one of the takeaways that I saw when we were, when we were going through this crisis and several other, I see somebody on the questions has mentioned 9-11 and the situation was the same then, was that one thing that struck me was that this is not a time um, well, actually, this is a time of partnership. We all talk a lot about partnership between venues and organizers and, and contractors and what have you, but this is a time for it to be true. 
This is not the time, however, to call in favours. This is not the time to be trying to mess around with people on terms and conditions on price. This is the time to be working together to try and do that. Exactly to your point, Cliff, that it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, we're in this together, which is, I know, an overused scenario, but it's, it's absolutely true. And that I've seen people already doing it with people I've been talking to is that there is that temptation to say, look, mate, you helped us out before we need to help you. Sorry, we helped you out before we need to do that now. Or we need to give our money back or whatever. This is not the time to do this. This is a time to be pragmatic, to be honest and work together and doing that. And that might sound an obvious thing to say, but it's a very key thing and, and folds into the planning and how we do that as well. And I think that also helps because that's a real positive for then as you start to think about when the venue reopens, when the shows can run, it can only strengthen the, the partnership then. Then you may go back to asking people for calling in favours and stuff as well. I know we all do to each other, but that's in a different situation which to me sounded very, very, very reminiscent of what you, you talked about when we were in Hong Kong in 2003. We, we did have an advantage, uh, I must say, and that's the fact that we had a professional staff that, that was not impacted by external forces, and we had a very professional organizer. I mean, it, it, the UBM was our largest commercial customer, um, and fortunately, we were working with one primary um, um, organizer, and we both had the same objective, and that was to minimize the impact of our staffs and our business and get the building back up and operating as soon as we could at, at full speed. Again, we, we never closed, but we couldn't hold business because nobody could attend. But uh, it doesn't matter whether you're working with one professional organizer or 10 new organizers. You've got to be fair, you've got to be reasonable, and you've got to realize you're working with something that was beyond the control of either venue or the organizer. And if our goal um, in Shenyang, for instance, in, in the last two months, has been to try to do everything we're doing without the need for legal services. In other words, do it on a business basis, a fair and reasonable basis and deviate from anything that may create a legal problem because again, we've got the same objective. That's very clear. Okay, guys, just gonna open up for questions. In a second, but you know, to summarize, I think what um, Cliff was saying and what we're interjecting is, okay, we know this is a serious emergency for us all. There's no point in underestimating or overestimating that. But the key thing, as I said at the start and I see is uncertainty here. And I think something Cliff just said is really important there is we just have to accept that there is uncertainty and we can't control everything. I know all of us are leaders of businesses and as leaders, we all like to control everything, but we can't control things at the moment. So we have to admit that there is uncertainty and, and be clear on that. But where there is certainty, also be clear on that and make sure it's clear. And that's part of what we so long is communicate, communicate, communicate. There's often a tendency, and I've done it myself, when you're in situations like this, just to literally hunker down and not say anything until you absolutely have to. But from, from the experience, as we've said, that's the opposite of what we need to do. And that's an important part of the fundamental thing that Cliff quite rightly is saying, and thankfully 41% uh, of you already had, is have the plans in place. But also when you have those in plans in place, be prepared to evolve them, prepare to test them and keep looking at them. Um, I remember once we had an emergency in the office and no one could find where their plans were. So that's not a good situation to have in terms of where we are. Um, but also the final thing I would say is just as we go into questions is um, remember this is about survival, but it is about being ready for the future, being ready for the, for the light at the end of the tunnel. And having a good emergency preparedness plan not only allows you to survive, but does allow you to be in the best shape possible in terms of relationships, in terms of the business, in terms of where it is and coming out the other side. Um, so that's, that's the key, if you think, if you like us to, to, to where we are. So I think enough of me talking and, and what have you. Let's see, um, Kai, I don't know whether you want me to go through the questions or, or how, how do you want to do this? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll happy to come in here and, and call up the colleagues who have asked questions on the chat. Um, I'd like to do one polling question first, if I may, because um, some of the questions are zooming in on numbers of shows effective and, and uh, reschedulings and postponements. Um, I'd like to share one polling question we've prepared and I will put it on screen now because it will nicely lead us into this. And the question is, how many events 
uh, approximate number, if you don't really know yourself, uh, the precise number. Have you had booked at your venue or are you involved with, uh, in, with booking that have been adversely impacted by COVID-19? So I'll leave that open for a while and ask you to, to share your view and, and your, personal, your personal experience from the area where you work on. And I'll leave it open for five more seconds. We should have a fancy theme music for this. Um, my work on it for the next one. Um, so let me end the poll. And again, thanks, thanks uh, for for participating and share the results. And it's. It's pretty much in line with what we've seen in the media. It's pretty much in line with what we've heard from the industry. Um, nobody is not affected. This is a global situation that is has really taken our industry um, all around the world. Um, the highest share of people here on the call have had to uh, rearrange or is busy rearranging more than 11 events. So um, um, the, the good news about the light at the end of the tunnel is we, we, we got a video today at UFI from a small show in China taking place uh, on this day. So today uh, a show was open. Uh, in China. And I know that in Shenyang, uh, Diane, you're on the call as well, and you shared in, in an earlier call, uh, a few days back in another UFI Connect session, that you're getting ready to host the show in April. So we'll all be looking east, we'll all be looking to, to China to see how the business is picking up again. And um, I would like to call up uh, Alice, Alice Matu. Um, you posted a question about the changes after 9 11, if you could ask that to Cliff and Simon, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can, but we can't see you. Okay, there you are. so no, my question is, Hello. good morning, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Um, thank you for this session. My question is, um, after 9-11, a lot changed in the world. Uh, we saw airlines um, going into security and bag checks and the likes, and you know, a world changed from what we knew it. Um, with the COVID-19 situation, how do we see this impacting events? Do you see us going into wearing masks, taking temperatures? What, what, what do you, I know you don't have an answer, but what do you imagine that could look like? So who wants to take it? Cliff, Simon? I'll say something first, but I think I'm probably just going to defer to Cliff, because I, I was on a call, uh, I can't remember which day it was, my, my day was um, I was on a call yesterday where they were talking about operations already in the in the shows in China that are up and coming and the discussions they've started to have on what needs to happen. Um, they've talked a lot about how venues are going to have to get new cleaning regimes and be more cleansed. Um, possibility of um, um, temperature checks at entrances in the same way we had bag checks, but that's not totally clear. Um, but also, you know, Basically, it's that whole idea. No one's quite clear on how social distancing can or cannot work or whether it will need to work. One interesting fact that I hadn't realized was that um, in each of the hospitals that are being built, um, all the shell scheme or the various um, ex ex exhibition material that's being used, all the metal parts will now have to be disposed of or melted down, um, which as soon as you hear it is very logical, but I hadn't heard that until this morning which is interesting because in the short term that may provide a shortage of, uh, of shell scheme and other materials as well. So, but that shows you the extent of the deep cleaning and the things that are, people are talking about doing in terms of those things. Cliff, I don't know whether you've um, heard any more of, of how these initial shows that are opening up in China are dealing with the issue. Well, early on, uh, particularly in Xinjiang, because we were hoping to get Xinjiang open uh, as early as we could, we were a reasonable distance away from Hubei, and uh, we hadn't had so many cases. So we worked very, very closely with government and encouraged government uh, to keep this and consider it. We let them know that we were working closely with UFI and using the professional standards endorsed by UFI, as well as the International Association of, of Venue Managers that we belong to. Uh, we did everything we could to sell them that we were ready to do our part and be proactive and we hoped that they would be proactive in thinking through that early. We were expecting uh, at a minimum temperature checks as people enter the building. Um, 
China is much has been much more aggressive with the mask. The U.S. is is almost the masks are almost non-existent um, as, as to the public. But now it's being considered considered a possibility. Hopefully that's that's not going to be proven to be too late. But to to Alice's point and yours, Simon, I think we've all got to expect a real change in what we're doing. We're also going to have to be changed. We're going to have to be prepared for some grandstanding because I think communities tend to overreact initially and they're going to be asking for some things that are probably unreasonable. And we're going to have to be ready to deal with that and try to influence those decisions. Um, someone that's online from China, maybe Diane Chen from Shenyang, uh, they're talking about the requirement of showing actually producing a health card, some kind of health document before you come into the building. Diane might be able to clarify if she's on. I don't see her, but uh, but that sort of thing, some some degree of 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 health card that that indicates you've gone through a certain amount of checking. Um, and I mean, it's a given we better be ready to understand what deep cleaning really means. And the deep cleaning is going to have to be visible and apparent to everybody coming in and out of that building. We're also going to have to be prepared for greater first aid type procedures to where if somebody's sick, we're going to have to know what to do with them immediately, getting them out of the building, getting them to the right place. Things like that are going to have to change. So, so the first aid procedures, the, the, the teams that are circulating the building and watching and the, the maintenance teams are going to have to be extremely functional, um, efficient and, and visible. Thank you, Kit. Thank you, Simon. This, uh, at least I hope that answered your question. And by the way, it answered a number of questions that, that came up in, the, in, in a different, in a very similar context about changes that will have to be made in getting the venues back up and running. So thank you for the question, Alice. Uh, let me call up, uh, and I hope I pronounced the name right, forgive me if I don't, Anwar Dude, because uh, you asked something about shows upcoming schedulings. Yeah, hi, Cliff. Uh, well, I, I, we all know what's happening globally around everywhere. There's a lot of uh, uncertainty right now. And China playing a very dominant role in uh, major shows across the world. And uh, seeing China getting back on its feet in the next four to six months, uh, do you think organizers have, uh, have to re-strategize themselves and cater more to the domestic uh, demand in terms of participation from exhibitors, visitors, or do you think uh, the doors will open up soon once things are settled down? And because let's be very honest about this, uh, no show thrives without China because the massive uh, role what they play in any global event uh, in terms of uh, presenting the technology or innovation and India for that matter, I'm talking more from point of view of India that we are most of our shows see almost like 20, 30% Chinese exhibitors coming in. So just some thoughts on that. My, my quick thoughts before Simon, maybe. Um, I, we all on this session understand the global economics of exhibitions and major meetings. Um, we all understand the economic benefit to the communities that we're in the states and provinces we're in and the, and the countries we're in to international visitation uh, as it relates to our exhibits. I would be very surprised if the common goal is not to return to some reasonable degree of normalcy. In other words, not emphasis on just domestic. I think the, the emphasis will remain on the global activity. Yeah, no, I, I tend to agree, and I'd actually go a step further. I think the importance of international trade, per se, to the world economy is going to be important. And we know how uh, exhibitions drive that. A lot of the messages that UFI have been putting out have been very strong about how 
exhibitions are the main route to recovering the economy. And I think that's one of the most powerful messages that have been put out there. So I think it's, it's almost, we will be a passenger of the need to drive more international trade. But on the other hand, we'll also be the conduit and the, and the driver of that as well. So I think that desire will mean that people will want to return to international trade shows and international meetings. But your, your point's well made. I don't know when that will be. My, my anticipation is the way we will emerge from this is, well, actually, I'd say another way. I, I, everyone says we see China emerging. As Kai said, there's a show in China this week. But of course, that's great. That is fantastic. But there's no way China can have an international show because everybody else's borders are closed, let alone theirs. So the point's going to be is you'll need more and more international borders to open, which will depend on where the, the wave of the virus goes across the world and what have you that will affect that. So I don't know when that will be, but my sense combined with the fact that um, I see more and more organizers saying they've got clients who are, yes, they're wanting their money back or they're wanting to cancel, but they're desperate to still do shows. Things, I think that will come back. So we're going to be, I think the demand will be there because it'll be there for the economy, because it's a good way to reboot everything. It'll depend. It's all going to come down to restrictions um, and a little bit to attitudes. But I think as we saw with 9-11, um, in the weeks after 9-11, no one wanted to go anywhere near traveling. And that faded over a matter of months as people got the necessity of moving back and got used to the, to, the, uh, to the checks and what have you. And I think um, that's probably the best comparison to where we are um, in terms of how we will emerge. So thank you, um, uh, Anwar. Thanks for, for, for your question. Um, you've touched on a point that Zanetta was asking from, from Poland. What's your opinion about the quality of events um, that will be smaller and much smaller quantities of exhibitors? You've also touched on uh, the issue of borders needing to reopen and, and travel needs to restart before we can have shows that are international in name, also international in participation. Again, let me bring in Adeline Larocque, because there's another dimension to this conversation, and that also covers the policies of companies when it comes to travel, and not just the fact that travel is possible. Adeline, welcome to the Uti Connects conversation. If we find you and you find the unmute. Well, she's, she's lost somewhere in cyberspace. Let me read out her question. Um, uh, because, because she asks, uh, how can we handle travel bans of companies visiting or exhibiting after the countries and the governments have opened up the borders again? So what is the communications line, the communication strategy uh, the advocacy needed to convince companies, especially large corporate companies, uh, who were among the early ones to tell their staff not to travel, to change their mind again and consider travel to be safe enough or even necessary? I, I don't think there's an simple answer to that. I think that plays to a lot of the things we've been trying to do in, in promoting our industry and in promoting our media for a long time is to really promote the value of actually people being there. It's the value of the human connection and making sure the right people are there. I think there's something to be said of us, and I've said this for quite a while, I think as an industry we need to adjust sometimes our stance for targeting volume to be targeting quality. And I think in the messages we give to exhibitors and to buyers, we should be doing the same. Is It's not necessarily please send us 100 buyers, it's please send us the 20, the 50, right buyers who can get the most ROI and the most advantage from the show because I think that will benefit us and benefit them but then on top of that we need to demonstrate what the ROI. There's a question that I saw, I saw Christopher McEwen asked which I think is a very good one which I've been speculating about is we forget also companies most of the bigger companies have international networks of people and local agents and what have you and it may be a, bit, a big thing that we get more and more international clients represented by local agents, by local businesses, by local representatives. I know we have a lot of, a lot of that already and I, I know in the early stages of this we, we, when we had some shows that Chinese representatives were being, um, you know, booths were being manned by representatives in Europe. So that might be a model but for me I think it's that key of demonstrating our messaging to why people should come and, and to be honest that's at the core of why you should have events. Uh, Kai, I might just, just say one thing and this is, this is something that I hope and I actually anticipate 
Um, we're really dependent a lot now on our medical community and industry and WHO and CDC. Um, I heard that they're coming up with all kinds of potential tests. Hopefully there'll soon be some kind of test that will give us all an opportunity to, to, to much more easily be checked for COVID-19. Um, and that can be used in the future when these things occur again. Uh, a test that we can do, I mean, something as easy as a blood sample from which you get a card. Um, a card that could be presented by anybody wanting to travel, get on an airplane, go into a venue, um, contractors who've got to go into a venue and set up, uh, exhibitors that have to go into the venue, a card that virtually says, as of a certain date, we don't have COVID-19. And if they come up with those kind of tests for us, that'll help get back on track quicker. I mean, it, SARS seemed to capitalize on taking your temperature. I mean, there's still many airports in the world that are taking your temperature as you come off the airplane and back into the arrival area. And, and so maybe something that our medical community will come up with is something even more sophisticated, but that will actually show um, from an easy test, we don't have COVID-19. Thanks, Jeff. Um, there will be advances on technology. There will be advances on the medical field that will help us. Uh, we have a few minutes left. I want to make sure we touch on two areas. Um, Chris McCoon, if you have Chris McQueen, Queen, I'll never learn your name, I always say Chris. Um, if, if you're on the call, you made a very interesting point over on the chat uh, on the way to get around international travel by sending regional representations to international shows. So you want to share that briefly with the group. Not sure if, he, if, if, we, if he's on mute or unmute. And, and the comment Chris made was, uh, I wonder whether the shows across the world will continue to have international exhibitors, but they may be local offices representing international brands for quite some time. So I thought um, I, I wanted to, to add to this conversation. Um, let's, let's call up uh, Tom Kelman uh, from, from the US, because you, you had a comment uh, in regards to the risks rewards equation and as well a question, uh, how to deal with those players in the area who are not that community driven. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. I hope you can hear me. Uh, yeah, Tom, I can see you. Um, yeah, I didn't uh, have a bad hair day going, but uh, at least I have hair. Um, the, uh, I'm calling to you from uh, about 12 miles from New York City and uh, 40 to 45 a thousand people that are uh, infected right now. So um, uh, the walls are getting closer, as we say. But but yeah, my, my two points are, are are that we will get through this, and when that day comes, and as it arrives, we need to be reminding people that uh, uh, the risk will never go away. Now the risk, uh, just like the risk in traveling, uh, air travel has never gone away. That's why we go to security. So the risk will never go away ever again uh, in our lifetimes. And so we'll we'll adapt as society adapts to to uh, different steps. Whether it's uh, like Cliff mentioned, uh, having a test and having a card that says I'm clean. Uh, that will be pushed back on by privacy rights advocates, but I think uh, will be some progress in that. And uh, but we just need to be stressing the reward, which is uh, that that uh, you will go to a show in Germany or China or anywhere else to see hundreds and hundreds or dozens and dozens of of your clients, and that's better than getting on dozens of airplanes uh, to do the same thing. So there will come a day when I don't think it's appropriate right now to be reminding people of that, but there will come a day when the light is at the end of this tunnel, as one of the writers wrote, that that we start 
easing that message forward that says we're getting closer and, and, and remember the power of the trade show is what we're talking about. And there are companies, Boeing and others that have travel restrictions right now, travel bans, but in time as the risk comes down and that we're reminding them that this is the way to most effectively do it, we will overcome that. So I don't think we're gonna see travel bans moving forward into uh, ad infinitum. Uh, but 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 so that's my one point, and I'll come off of that soapbox uh, and just say that um, yeah, we were faced yesterday or two days ago with a message from the number two air show in the world uh, in London, Farnborough Air Show, that they were not going to be able to return any of the uh, exhibitor. That the show is in July, it canceled uh, a week or two ago. So this months ahead, uh, they canceled before they had to do all the main contracts with the tent uh, de Boer structures and, and security teams and closed circuit TVs and all that. So there is definitely money being saved and thankfully they canceled early enough that we didn't all make airline tickets and everything else. But uh, initial response was that they're gonna retain the 100% of, uh, of the exhibitor's fees, force majeure. We all, many of us have that on our contra contracts. I have it on all 40 of my contracts. But I'm not going to look at a client and say, force majeure, I don't give, I'm not giving you any money back. Um, and until yesterday, I, because they started getting very much beaten up on social media, that was Farm Brewer's position. We're not getting any money back. And I'm just a little bit, and, and, the, and, and, and those of us the, in the other air show business, in that particular one, we're going to have to live with the fallout. And we all have to think about that, that, very few exhibitors are going to accept this force majeure, I don't have to give you any money back clause. And that's what I think, uh, in my case, uh, you know, we all need to be thinking about realistically. Uh, a sta my statement says, look, from the minute I launched this project, I incurred costs. And yes, I'm not delivering you a show, but for the last year or the last two years, I've incurred costs. So we're able to give you 80% of your money back or whatever the number might be. I think that's that's working very well for me and my clients. And if it hasn't been something discussed, I think it's a, an interesting approach that, that will give some of our, our exhibitors some confidence to come back. Just like we can't buy an airline ticket and expect to get all of that money back in normal times, in the future, we could expect to get some money back. So if that hasn't been addressed, I'd love to hear that. But those are my two points from uh, COVID Central right now. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Tom. Simon, over yeah. to you. I tend to agree with you on the travel bans, as I think we, we said earlier, they, they, they just can't go on forever. But I think the point you've made about um, Farmer, I, I don't, I've got nothing to do with Farmer, I'll just say, but I, my understanding is Farmer is about to be turned into another hospital as well. So there may be other reasons for the cancellation. That said, your point about, the, um, about returning uh, monies, I must have had 20 different people, most of them financial institutions in the last week, ask me about this because they're all trying to weigh up about our ability as an industry to hold on to cash. And I told them the same as you do. I said, commercially, any organizer worth their, worth their salt in the world will have T's and C's, which will say, no matter what, we can hold on to your money and we can move or cancel and do whatever. And I think we all do have that. But I also said, because I've seen this in previous uh, disasters and problems we'll have, Michael Duck will remember better than me, the, the terrorist attack in Mumbai, where we, we had our show ready to open um, and the terrorists came in literally um, 18 hours before we were due to open. And we in the end had to give the money back to all of the clients there. I think your point's well made. It's, it's not about what the T's and C's say, it's about what your commercial relationship is with your exhibitors. And I think you can only hold on it, depends on where you sit with them, where the strength of your brand is and what have you. But either saying I'll retain 80, you know, 80%, or giving a credit for next year's show and then trying to work out how you can do that and giving people the option. I've seen people do all of those and I think, but I think absolutely just sitting there and saying, we're not gonna return your money. Um, it's a brave thing to do. When I say brave, I, I mean potentially verging on stupid if you don't know your clients well enough. So, but, uh, but, but I also know there'll be plenty of people who can hold onto the money because they have a good relationship with their exhibitors and they can work it through in other ways. So, You've just, it's, it's, a, it's a very important question. And I, and I think from a venue standpoint, um, we, we can't make decisions that are short term um, based on the economics. The decision has to be a long term decision to maintain a relationship and in fact serve as a catalyst 
for more business in the future. So if we're, we're careless in asking for things that aren't fair and reasonable, uh, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. Thanks both. Um, no, uh, we have not enough time to go into all the questions that came up on the chat. We were going to bring up Chris uh, as, as promised as we fixed the technical issue there. We had a while we're putting him on. We have a special session on virtual events again um, next Tuesday as the next UFI Connect session. As a few questions came up about hybrid events, uh, how to add digital to events moving forward. So um, you can register for that on ufi.org slash I saw the question come up and on the subject of that, for me, I think, as you know, I've been saying for quite a long time that I think digital, virtual, all of these things are real enhancements of our industry. And if there ever was an opportunity now, as the whole world realizes how digital and virtual can enhance things, this is a great opportunity to do it. So. Yes, but let's bring in Chris, if you are unmuted now. Sorry for that issue earlier. Hi. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I thought you'd. I thought you'd. Uh, I thought you'd all just be interested to hear because we're all talking about how uh, people won't travel anymore and, and what might happen in the future. And uh, I thought you'd be interested. I, I run a. We, we we run Montgomery. Run a few shows in in Singapore, and one of them being a food show. Um, and at this time, mm. where international governments and government associations just aren't booking in to show i mean they're, they're, of course they're not beginning to show right? they, they don't know if they can travel because they're, they're they've got their travel restrictions uh, across all all countries they uh, we, we literally just signed us meat yesterday for a show in singapore through a local office because they want to show that even though the us uh, the, the, the actual the, the, the people selling won't be able to travel currently to Singapore. They want to show that the actual product is safe and it is good and it is quality to, 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 to eat. And I think that will happen with a lot of brands in a lot of industries that actually, although you physically for a, for a while, maybe, maybe six months, maybe a year, maybe two, who knows, but you still will be able to buy a brilliant product that will be able to be freighted across the world. And that's maybe where we got to start. I don't know, maybe, maybe not, but we literally, we did that yesterday. Maybe that's, maybe that's the start right. for us all. Yes, Thank, thanks, thanks for sharing that. And, and uh, this, this circles back to, to what Simon said in his opening statement, like, like any crisis before this will end. Um, the last question is gonna go to Layla. Um, because it's the perfect question to wrap up a conversation like we're having today. So Leila, if you can hear us, please show yourself and speak. Hello. Hi, can oh. you hear me? Hi, hi, how are you? From Dubai. Um, yeah, that was my, like, I have a very simple question. Obviously, I've listened to all of these, um, but I think the big elephant in the room is, should we plan our H2 events? Should we continue planning these, working with our suppliers, working with venues, working with our exhibitors? Um, and um, we all know after big recessions due to whatever crisis the, the events industry sees arise, we know that as an economic pattern, but um, realistically, should we be thinking about 2021 or should we be thinking about 2020 at all in form of events? Um, I just want to, you know, and I know no one has a crystal ball, but that is what is on my mind right now. There it is, the crystal ball question. Who's going to take it? Thank you, Leila. Well, my quick answer is I'm hopeful that the organizers will be innovative enough to come up with anything that uh, has demand or can create demand in this interim period, but certainly look toward 2021 with uh, optimism. Uh, we're, we're all, not only are we gonna come out of it, but I think we're gonna be innovative. Our eyes are gonna be more open and hopefully we're gonna be more prepared to deal with the crises in the future. When we take another survey six months from now, I hope 99% of us will have emergency preparedness plans and it will include things like pandemics. But we, we've just got to do a better job of, of, of leadership and being prepared for these emergencies and a whole lot more innovative in, in as venues helping the organizers develop concepts that'll work in the interim. And, um, and, and, and work closely with our community to make sure the community broadcasts itself and, and, 
advertises itself as being absolutely safe. Simon, last words from you. I'll start with the difficult part of the question and follow, finish up on a positive. I, 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 my opinion as to when this industry will open up changes every week. Um, and I'm afraid everything that I hear, and bearing in mind I'm kind of on the side at the moment, I think everybody's planning for a September start, certainly in Europe at least. Um, the more time goes on, the more I think that's wishful thinking rather than reality. I suspect there's a very strong chance, certainly in the UK, maybe also in Europe, that, that gatherings may be banned for the whole of the year. That's certainly some of the rumblings from the UK government, at least. I can't, that's, that's, I don't know how true that is, but that's what the rumor mill is saying, and I can see the logic. So I think planning for anything other than September is probably, unless you're in China, is probably uh, wrong. Um, I think the chances of us going all the way and not having anything till at least November, December, maybe even 2021 is very real. And I think you have to run a plan that, 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 that says that. That's what I'm asking. Every company I'm involved with, that's what I'm saying. Run a plan that starts in September and then knock a month off at a time to, to, to your next scenario. Because that, let's face it, anything that's in September now that gets postponed is not going to get to run again in 2020. Well, 99% certainly. However, I do agree with what Cliff said and I do agree with what Chris said. I think this is a massive time for us as an industry to find new ways. I think what Chris said about um, the, the example he gave and about how events can be different things. We spent a lot of time at the CEO conference earlier in the year, which seems a long time ago now, um, before this crisis, but talking about how the industry needs to reinvent itself or continue to reinvent itself and what have you. If ever we needed a stimulus to do that, and in fact, one of our speakers there talked about how us as an industry had lacked a burning platform. Well, <laughs> whether we wanted one or not we have one now so this is a time when innovation can flourish and as i said interactions like this the story that chris showed these are the times when we've got opportunities to really improve whether that's digital whether that's different ways of planning our events whatever it is this is the time to do it because this medium will still be strong it just might be a bit different in the new norm than what it was before we went in Thank you, wonderful, wonderful comment to end this uh, session. Thank you, Cliff. Thank you, Simon. Uh, it's been it's been a pleasure and an honor. It's it's 11 p.m. in Hong Kong. Thanks for all the colleagues from China. It's 11 a.m. on the East Coast. Uh, so good morning, America. It's I think 8 a.m. now on the West Coast. Um, uh, housekeeping as we wrap up as America starts the day, China goes to bed. Um, we didn't, couldn't touch on all the questions. If you have questions, send them to media at ufi.org and we'll do our best to find some answers that we can share. We will send you a survey uh, if you have participated today and ask you to fill in, I think, a two-page uh, WebMonkey survey to help us focus the sessions going forward. And if you want to share about what we've discussed, feel free. This was an open forum uh, to you. Please, please use the hashtag uficonnect so we can, we can follow up on this. Um, I already said next Tuesday, we will do the next UPI Connect session. Uh, the theme will be virtual events. We're gonna have uh, Dahlia from the US, uh, Matthias from calling German living in London, and Enrico, who I think right now is in Dubai. So another global conversation, 10 a.m. New York, 4 p.m. Paris, 6 p.m. Dubai, 10 p.m. Hong Kong. So we're staying in this time zone for this session. Last word from me, we're going to keep the chat open for a few more minutes if you have still some conversations going on there. It's kind of the equivalent to these little chats on the side in the back of a conference room or out there at the coffee table. Um, and as always, uh, the, the programming we do is supported by partners we have by our diamond sponsors. So thank you to TSEP, thank you to the National Tourism Council of Qatar, thank you to Shenzhen World, also getting ready to run shows in May there, and thank you to our friends from Freeman over in the US. Uh, as always, we've run a few minutes over. I hope it's been worth your time. Thank you for the lively discussion. Everybody, TGIF, have a great weekend. Bye.